Before we begin, just some house rules. Please identify yourselves and the organisation you are from before posing your questions. There are microphones along the aisles and our ushers are also on hand to pass around the microphones. Over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, Your Excellency, uh, distinguished guests, uh, colleagues and students of SMU, and I'm actually to, happy to see so many European students. Those are our, many of them are probably our exchange students uh, who spent here six months uh, <coughs> in Singapore. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, good afternoon. Uh, it's for me, I must say, a particular uh, pleasure, pleasant moment uh, to welcome uh, His Excellency uh, Herman van Rompuy as the 17th speaker in our SMU Presidential Distinguished Lecture Series. And it's the fourth lecture of, these, uh, of, of 2014. Uh, why it is so uh, pleasant for me to, to do this is, I guess you know that, right? Uh, I'm also Belgian. Uh, and it's probably the first and only time I will be sitting on this uh, uh, stage here uh, with another Belgian. Um, just to remind you, this lecture series, the Presidential Distinguished Lecture Series, was launched in 2005 uh, with the aim of stimulating uh, discussions and dialogue among faculty, staff and students, as well as our larger external audience, and that on issues of contemporary interest and significance. Uh, Earlier this year, we had uh, Dr. Francis Fukuyama, uh, we had the former president of the World Bank, Mr. Robert Zellick, and we had also professor a few weeks ago, or actually a few days ago, Professor Rosabeth Moskanter of the Harvard Business School. You see that we bring in a mixed group of people. Uh, we're, I, I think we're really most privileged to have today His Excellency Mr. Van Rompuy to join this group of outstanding speakers. As, um, the MC already introduced, as Grace already said, uh, he has a very distinguished career. I'm not going to go uh, through the whole uh, CV of Mr. Van Rompuy. Uh, I've learned one thing that is, the longer the CV the, that one cites in the beginning of a session, probably the less important the person is. Uh, the, uh, the rule is that the shorter the CV, probably the more important you are and the more people know you. So I'll keep it very short uh, today. Um, but uh, I hope that we will have the opportunity today uh, to, uh, in the question and answer session, we will use the same style that we have used in a few other sessions, whereby over the next 30, 40 minutes, I will probably ask a number of questions, and then well, I will open it for questions of the uh, audience, but that we get to know a little bit more about uh, what happened in the G20, because uh, His Excellency just came back from the G20 in, uh, in Brisbane, in uh, Australia, uh, but also I hope that we can talk a little bit about the future of Europe, economically, but also socially probably. Uh, maybe a little bit about your experiences as the uh, President of the European Council over the last five years, um, and maybe your view on what's going on here in Asia. So Your Excellency, I um, would like to start off with a simple question. You flew in this morning from uh, Australia, from Brisbane. Uh, I'm not gonna ask you whether you had a good flight, that is not important. Uh, but uh, what were your impressions of the G20? What can we, Take away, what are the takeaways from the G20 uh, as you saw it? First of all, thank you uh, having the occasion to, uh, to have a talk with you, fellow Belgian slash Flemish. Huh? True. <laughs> it's even more detail is important. <laughs> your, your, your origins are even uh, the, the very city of Oudenaarde, which is the hometown of my wife, so we are really very close. Uh, but uh, I come back from the G20 meeting, it will be my last G20 meeting, and I, I didn't attend the first one in, uh, in London and in Washington. That was just after the financial crisis, and actually the G20 at the level of leaders uh, was established to give an answer to the financial crisis. And they were at that time, uh, let's say, rather successful. Afterwards, my analysis is that those decisions, although important one and successful, were rather easy compared to what we have to do now. Why? Because saving a bank, at that time it was putting public money in it. Uh, and the stimulus program, uh, deficit spending, are not the most difficult decisions. Afterwards came the regulation, financial regulation, and you touched upon vested interests, uh, then afterwards, how coordinate or can we coordinate economic policies in such a diverse landscape as the global economy? 
Uh, the Eurozone has other problems as the United States. I mean, emerging economies uh, have other problems as the Eurozone. And in the emerging economies, you have a lot of, uh, you know, lot of differences. So coordinating uh, economic policies is quite a t task tough uh, task. And we have the same problem, by the way, inside the Union. We have to coordinate among the 19 of the Eurozone and the 28 of the, of the Union. Ye yesterday, the day before yesterday, we took, I think, for the first time in, in a couple of years, concrete decisions, uh, focusing, of course, on growth and jobs. That's nothing new. Uh, but focusing on investment, investment, infrastructure investment, private investment. So this global in investment initiative and also creating a hub where that, uh, the, the policies for the coming years are coordinated in some way, that was rather something concrete, uh, not just expressing intentions, but focusing on concrete results. But Again, uh, it is a difficult task to bring all those economies on the same line. But the G20 meeting is not only important uh, for the meeting itself and, and the, the, the conclusions of the meeting. The G20 meetings are also important because you have a lot of not side events, but bilateral meetings uh, where leaders can meet. Huh? And then I make, uh, in this context, a more general observation. Uh, I think the sixth time I attend this kind of meeting. When you see all those leaders, the President of the United States, the President of China, uh, the Prime Minister of, uh, of, uh, of, of, of Japan, the, the, the President of the Russian Federation, all around the table discussing the economy and even topics beyond the economy, that's, it's quite reassuring because they are in speaking terms. And I think it is the first time in human history that on a regular basis, leaders all over the globe meet each other, discuss, try to find common stands. And this is hopeful for the world as a whole. I'm not naive and I'm not uh, an observer of, of, after all those years in politics, you, you, you lost the, the, the last uh, uh, let's say, uh, the last millimeter of naivety, naiv naivety yeah? but it, 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 it's quite uh, an experience each time to see 80% of the world economy represented uh, by people who have the highest responsibilities, most of them are directly uh, elected, and then all discussing and on the same topic and looking for solutions. As long as this exists, then I would say, even if the outcomes is not always what we, uh, what we expected, but as long as this exists, I'm hopeful for the humankind, that, that we can keep the world uh, at peace, and, and that we, we have now an institution that is even more important to some extent than the United Nations and the United Nations Security Council. Um, although the, in some moments the, the, the UN is of utmost importance, but here, and on a regular basis, that kind of meeting is quite exceptional. And so uh, I'm very, I was very honored to attend those meetings. And, then if, and again, this time, we focused on investment, concrete result, growth, and, and, and jobs. Without growth and jobs, most of our societies become unstable. Mm -hmm. And certainly in the in those, in what we call industrial nations, their social systems come under huge tension, even threatening the existence of the survival of the systems. So our system, our eco social economic system is based on growth. Without growth, we go not only in social and economic problems, we go in major political problems. So this is of the utmost importance that we join efforts together. Are you optimistic about the growth prospects? Because when I'm not an economist, I admit, but uh, when I read sort of economic predictions for the coming years, it seems as if the world is going into a slower mode of growth. Uh, almost no growth in Europe, limited growth in the United States. The emerging countries, China in particular, go to a lower level of growth than before. It's still 7%, still pretty good. but 
it's all a little bit lower. Are you optimistic? Yeah, optimistic and pessimistic. That's uh, no, no feelings there are all really interesting, I find. Um, but that is, it can be very superficial uh, uh, because it can change uh, o overnight. But um, I have a more nuanced view on, uh, on, on this. Nuance in this sense that the growth in China is still 7% probably is more sustainable at 7% than at 10%. Right? Growth in the United States is surprisingly high, surprisingly high. Partially the result of past policies. Uh, they put the financial house in order right after the financial crisis, was very helpful today. Um, and of course there is the shale gas revolution, a major game changer. It is due to, let's say, to the accident of nature, but also uh, mainly, I think, to the system who allows to develop that kind of, of, uh, of energy resources. Um, so they have now growth of around 3%, 3%, huh? which is quite high, surely for a mature economy, because it's much more difficult to have high growth rates for mature economies than for emerging economies. Yeah. Huh? In the emerging economies, there is a differentiation. Uh, and there I join uh, not your pessimism or your, uh, your lack of optimism, uh, but your, the diagnosis that uh, it is lower growth than we expected. Russia is in recession. Uh, Brazil is almost in recession. Um, others are have quite a lot of difficulties, not to speak about South Africa, for instance. In the Eurozone, uh, we have a low economic growth, growth. We have a structural economic growth of 0.5%. That's much too low to ha to, for, let's say, the, the welfare systems we have to finance. Of course, we can do better, and we will do better. We will do better, but it takes some time. It takes some time. But you have to, to look at, let's say, you have to look at all those things in a longer term perspective. And in this sense, I'm not so pessimistic, uh, to use those words again, because major efforts are made to reorient the economies. It is the case in China. I think it will also be the case in India. I think in Brazil they will draw the conclusions of the recent presidential elections uh, and, 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 and let's say, and, and the, the voice of the people, and that will be an incentive to do it in another way but, and to do it better. And in the Eurozone, we are embarked in a major countries on structural reforms. And some of our governments are taking courageous decisions, confronting also parts of public opinions, some parts of their own electorate. Huh? not to speak uh, of Italy or France and, and so on. So the, everybody knows that reforms of all kinds are inevitable, inevitable. In political life as in personal life, you always, not you always, but you often act in front of the abyss, knife on the throat and with your back against the wall. And then you, you, you take action. Uh, you can say it is too little and too late, and so on, but even in the private sector it is often the case. So uh, I think that these are a, a, an awareness all over the place that we have to change, that we have to reform uh, in difficult uh, political circumstances, in lively democracies as the European ones. Uh, but I see that leaders their responsibilities and that's quite encouraging. Mm. What do you think, I mean, coming, focusing a little bit more on Europe, you say we, we need to have these structural reforms or we are implementing these structural reforms without looking at immediate things that need to happen because that probably is very difficult for you to, to talk about given the fact that you're stepping down by the end of the month. Um, but sort of medium term, what do we need to do in Europe to get that economy going again? What are the sort of structural reforms or the ideas that you have about where, needs, where does Europe need to go? What 
what needs to work in Europe to make mm. it successful. But only speaking on the economic side. Yeah. So a lot can be done, has been done in some member states at the national level. And there, the reforms of the labor market and reforms in our pension systems are of key importance. In the labor market, it is about uh, uh, reforming uh, taxation on labor mm -hmm. because we are imposing too, too heavy burden uh, on labor, making labor uh, of employment in general less attractive. There is, no, there is not only the relation between, uh, let's say, you, you, you have two kinds of competitiveness, I will describe it in this way. You have the competitiveness of your own country, your own firm, vis-à-vis -vis the rest of the world, but you have also a competitiveness between the factor labor and the factor capital. If you put too heavy taxes on labor, then the incentive to have uh, substitution uh, of labor uh, by capital is you enhance that uh, that uh, that substitution. So um, we have the duality in in the labor markets, duality between uh, older workers with fixed contracts and younger workers with temporary contracts. So this becomes unsustainable because the first who are fired are the younger ones. So we have to, to have a system that, uh, that is less discriminatory than, than we have now in most of our, of our member states. And of course we have all kinds of what we call uh, flexibility in, in the labor market so that uh, employment can be adapted also more quickly to changes in, in economic activities. Uh, that is not easy because there are a lot of, there's a lot of resistance of the insiders and they forget that there are outsiders. Uh, the outsiders are the 11% of the mm -hmm. labor population who is unemployed. Uh, and then you have the, the reforms of the pension systems in most all of the, uh, the country. You have a prolongation of retirement age, de facto order the legal age. Uh, in our own country, I can still say our own country. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. In our own country, it is now, it will become 67 years, but only in 15 years' time. So I will, I am really uh, somebody who is anticipating all this because mm -hmm. I will retire at 67. So that is the retirement age that will be the retirement age of the future in, in, in our countries. But we are now de facto sometimes at uh, 59 and 60 percent. Mm. That is, of course, unsustainable with the average life expectancy of above the 80. Huh? Mm. In the 50s, we had in Western Europe and in, in my country, in your country, uh, we had a, a de facto no, and legally, but it was the same at that time, retirement age of 65. The average, average life uh, expectancy was 66. That's all. And now the gap is more than 20 years. Uh, but that is mainly the responsibility of the member states. From the union on, we can push, we can, uh, we can urge, uh, we, 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 we can ex, uh, ex, have some kind of peer pressure, but it's ultimately their responsibility. At the level of the union, there we have to exploit much more than we have now our single market. We, we tend to say Europe, and it's true, we have the biggest single market in the world. 500 million people with the highest purchasing power in the world. Uh, but we have to deepen our single market, not only in the, in the circulation or the free circulation of goods and services, but also, let's call it, although the, the word is not uh, the, the right one, in industry. Uh, we need an energy union, we need a single digital market, we need a research area all over the European Union. In each of these domains we are taking important steps, but we have to do much more mm -hmm. than we are doing now. There is a huge potential for growth still in the European Union if we join forces.
if we can abandon national champions, if we see what can be achieved uh, on, in the space of uh, the, the 28, we are too much focused still on a place, national states, and less on the space, the European Union. So I, uh, I'm not uh, desperate at all. There's still a huge potential for growth in the European Union. Okay. Um, you have been uh, chairing the European Council over the last uh, five years, and while there are quite a few Europeans in this room here today, some of our uh, students and, uh, and, and people here may actually not know what that role actually is. So if you could briefly explain us what you do the last five yeah. years. Uh, and uh, Ask it my wife. <laughs> and maybe also, uh, what were sort of defining moments in, the, in those five years? Uh, what, what were sort of, maybe not takeaways, but what are the defining moments or the important moments when you reflect back on those five years? Mm -hmm. But first of all, on the institutions, I, I often uh, had to, to answer that kind of question, very complicated. And so it's not complicated at all. Of course, if you don't want to understand, you never understand. Uh, that, that's true. Huh? So we have a Europe. Are you referring to journalists? No, no, no. no. Oh, okay. Sorry. <laughs> it's not personal. Not personal. <laughs> so we have a European Parliament. That's clear. Our democracies each have a Parliament. We have a parliament, 750 members for 500 million people. Uh, we have a government, although you can make a lot of nuances, and if the lawmakers are here, or professors in law, and I see some of them, uh, they can put all the nuances you want, and I will be the first one. Uh, but let's say that the European Commission is very close to what you can call a government. What is the European Council? The European Council is a collective body that you can associate with the Chief of State. Um, our role actually is a role that is different from the executive branch. We are not involved in the daily running of the Union and of course very different of the legislative branch. We are not involved at all in legislation. So we are giving uh, general orientations um, for policies in all kinds of domains and uh, we are giving impulses. Because the council is highly representative, because are the prime ministers and the presidents of all the 28 member states, encompassing 500 million citizens, they have a huge political and moral authority. When they speak, very difficult for other players in the European Union to contradict them. Although it can, eh? according to the rules, each has its own competence and its own role. So, for, for actually, the repartition of the roles is not uh, that difficult. But of course, we have we are we are not a state. We have 28 sovereign states. And so when you, for instance, speak on foreign policy and even on economic policy, even if we define a common position, which we are doing all the time, with 28, by consensus, by consensus, uh, this is translated, first of all, in 23 languages. We have not one language, 23 languages. I don't know them all, uh, so I can <laughs> reassure you. Uh, and according to the public opinions of those 28 member states. With the different political opinions are different. So you, you hear many voices. I'm happy when there is one message, the many voices, that will always be the case in the European Union, for the reasons I just mentioned. Yeah. Uh, the, the leaders are accountable in front of their parliaments, their electorate, in their own language, so that will always be somewhat complicated. But as long as we can decide uh, and have a common message uh, on substance, then uh, not only I can be happy, but also my successors and, uh, can be happy. So this is a complicating factor. Do you always have in the, in, the, in, in the European Union? But others are facing other problems. There are countries, major countries, with one president and one parliament and still a lot of difficulties to agree on one budget. Eh? Uh, so uh, every system 
has his own constraints and we are not uh, the only one. Of course, in a dictatorship, it's very easy. That's very easy. But in, uh, in a democracy, it's often complicated. So when you look back at these uh, five years, uh, I was saying, are there any defining moments or any moments that you thought, now it's going the wrong way, but we've been able to, uh, to, to revert back to the right way, or sort of moments where you say, we really made a breakthrough? Yeah, I had one issue to deal with, that was the survival of the Eurozone. And we were quite convinced that if the Eurozone collapsed, or had collapsed, the Union itself was in danger. The German Chancellor said it once, and I think she was right. But the Union is also the biggest peace project in the history of mankind. So there was much more at stake than simply a money. It was much more than a monetary operation. Of course, we had to, to use all the means uh, to, uh, to underpin the, the, the common currency, but the, the challenge uh, was, was quite, quite different, going far beyond uh, monetary policy and economic policy. It, it was about a political project and even a project of civilization. And I'm not exaggerating. Uh, and I think the leaders were fully aware of this. That's why when the rest of the world was discussing not if the uh, Eurozone would collapse, that was for sure. Uh, the only discussion was about the date. Uh, um, the leaders themselves were quite convinced that they had to do what they, what they could. Uh, and they, they would take all the risks needed and they will take all the initiatives needed to let the Eurozone survive. And this strong political will, this determination was present all over the crisis. And this made it possible that we uh, took away the existential threat to the Eurozone. Even if in large parts of the world people were not convinced of it. Uh, and some media uh, said to develop this idea even more than others. I'm, ex I'm using no we all very, diplomatic words, very diplomatic words. <laughs> Uh, so this was the main challenge for my presidency and I'm very happy that we succeeded. Of course, are the problems solved? All the problems? No, but it's never in politics. But you have to take problems one by one. And now it is the economy. Now we have to reinforce, let's say, the structural economic growth of the Eurozone and of the Union. Uh, we had, uh, we, I said, we, we, had, we put some building blocks already for the future. I had European councils on innovation, uh, on the digital market, on the energy union and so on. Uh, but my successor and I think even later on, they have to take it up and to deepen it. It's not an easy task uh, being responsible for the Union, you are never alone, of course. Huh? There is a collective effort. Because we have, and people d don't realize it completely, we have every time to agree with 28. Give you an example on climate change. We agreed on a reduction of greenhouse gases by 40% in 2030 compared to 1990. We are on track on our current or previous objective, minus 20% in 2020. We are on track. It's not a problem. We are credible when we say that we want to go further. It's a legally binding agreement. It's not just a declaration of political intentions. Huh? It is legally binding. But then we have to agree with 28. And it is sometimes a zero-sum game. If you do less, then the others have to do more. So it is a quite difficult exercise, but we succeeded. We succeeded. We made a European budget, shrinking European budget, with 28. It took us 35 plus 12, let's say 50 hours. 50 hours. I was Minister of the Budget 
making a budget and 50 out, 50 out, it's quite uh, uh, quite impressive. Huh? Uh, so we we made it with 28 in a shrinking budget, distributing money and uh, and uh, uh, having a deficit. That's not uh, that's not so easy. We may not have a deficit in the European Union. The European Union budget is a balanced budget. So it took us a major efforts, but we succeeded. So during the, Euro, the Eurozone crisis, and also outside this crisis management, on the budget, on climate change, on the sanctions of Ukraine, we succeed getting this unanimity. So we, the Union is not blocked. The Union uh, can work, the institutions can function. It can be a surprise for, for, for some. It is difficult, but it is doable. If in 1950, when one had said to Robert Schumann, I will hmm. give a, the Robert Schumann lecture later this evening, you will be not with six, and with, but instead of six, with 28. And if even 20 years ago, when we were with 12, one has, had said, we will be with 28, and it works, nobody. Can we believe to you. So it is something special, and but the main reason is, and then I finish this, this this chapter. The main reason is that everybody who is around the table of the European Council of Heads of State of Government, he knows that he has to make a compromise. When he is sitting there and he tries to. To, uh, or he thinks that he is the only one who is right. It, it will not work. So when he is sitting there, there is a convergence, there is a spirit of convergence. There is a culture of compromise. Without that culture of compromise, nothing is possible. Uh, if there is no political will to put it very neutral, you can achieve, you can achieve anything. Mm. But as, as long as there is this culture of compromise, uh, we can let the, the, the institutions function and get results also on very difficult issues. In my experience living in Europe a while ago uh, and talking about the European Union, it was for me like a sort of a mantra or, an, or that everything depended on the French-German relationship. Uh, is that still true today, or is the union now so big that that relationship between France and Germany is of less importance than it used to be? It's still two important countries. Uh, both of them, of together, they are half of the economy of the eurozone. It's different of the union, but half of the of the of the the, the economy. But it is the relationship is going beyond this. This n not only. You cannot, uh, let's say, translate this relationship in terms of economy, in terms of figures. Uh, why? Um, first of all, there is history. Mm -hmm. And history, we tend to forget uh, that, this, that uh, history exists in this time of, uh, of direct, uh, Let's say day of daily news, uh, of uh, social media. Uh, what is a news today is not news anymore two days later and so on. So people think that history doesn't exist anymore. No, history exists, it's deep in us enshrined. History li is, uh, lives also in our subconscious. I see this, this, uh, these days with the anniversary uh, of uh, the centennial of the, the start of the First World War. It is celebrated all over the place, 100 years, and it was 100 years ago. And people who are not aware of it, all of a sudden it comes back, the stories of their parents, their grandparents, and so on. So history exists even in the modern world. And that is also important for this Franco-German relationship. It is in historical relationship a relationship of war and now a relationship of peace. But going, coming back to the, 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 these days, France and Germany represent two kinds of culture. 
in the European Union. It is much more complicated than the North and the South, much more complicated between those who are in favor of fiscal discipline and those who are in favor of much more solidarity. Uh, but there are two different sensitivities. If they compromise, then let's say a lot of other countries can easily get along with it because each country has in some way can f is closer to either Germany, either, uh, either uh, France. France. The Belgians have a problem huh? <laughs> because we have also in our own country two cultures. Huh? So we can live with both. Huh? Um, but this is, this is really key for, uh, and that is still, still uh, very present in the union of today. Can the Union work without Franco-German relationship? Yes, but it's more difficult. And in, during my mandate, uh, we had a very strong relationship of, uh, between 2010 and the end of 2012. Later on, it, become, it became much more complicated. Uh, and we made the European budget, uh, we agreed on the banking union, uh, we made a deal on climate change without a Franco-German understanding or without a pre-cooked agreement between France and Germany. So the, the Union can work without that, but it's much more easy when there is that kind of strong relationship. That's why I was in favor of that relationship long before I took this office and I'm st still of this, uh, of this view. But we proved that mm -hmm. we can get agreements uh, without them. Maybe we should open for a few questions from the floor. Uh, um, if you uh, ask a question, please keep it short. Uh, we only have an hour, so no need for um, And uh, say who you are and where you come from. I see a first question there and I see a question in the middle. You'll get the microphone from one of our ushers. Or you can stand up, uh, whatever. Yes, take that one. That probably will be easier. Hello, uh, my name is Wei Yi and I'm from NUS. I'm a PhD student. Um, my question is about um, immigration. Now, uh, Singapore is an interesting country because uh, it has uh, a declining birth rate and an explosive uh, population growth. And uh, of course, it also uh, is a very prosperous economy. Is there any lesson, are there any lessons that uh, the EU could take from countries of big immigration like Singapore or Australia? Thank you. Related to immigration, yes. Each uh, country or continent has its own history. Uh, you can always draw lessons, uh, but you can compare the situation in Australia, based of founded on migration, with uh, the the European Union today. Uh, we all came from somewhere. Eh? The European population come from Asia. Eh? Uh, if you go back su sufficiently back in the time. Huh? So, but let's, let's uh, make it simple and speaking of the, the last centuries. So it is difficult to compare all those situations. What is the situation now in Europe? Is that we have huge immigration for of all kinds. Uh, and I'm now speaking in the terms uh, uh, that for us the term migration and immigration is for people coming from outside the Union. Inside the Union, we speak about the free movement of people. So there is, we don't use the word migration when we speak about uh, a Spaniard coming uh, to live and work in, uh, in, 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 in Belgium of a Romanian who can, who can, uh, who can work in, in the UK, if you're just an innocent example. Uh, but migration, migration is related to uh, extra-European uh, for the extra-European uh, uh, movements of people. We are facing a demographic shock, and we are now at 500 million. If the current trends continue, then we have to fill the gap 
with 40 or 50 million in the upcoming decades. So there is a demographic problem. Uh, and if we want to keep our growth rates of, let's say, one and a half, two percent, sufficient to keep our social models sustainable, then we need migration. It's less obvious today because we have unemployment. But in the longer term perspective, uh, migration is in some way inevitable. But that is the rational explanation. Of course, we are facing other elements. We are facing, um, and certainly now in the Mediterranean, huge instability. Um, people coming now to Europe from Afghanistan, Eritrea, uh, Syria, Lebanon, and so on. So we are facing also people who, who try to make a better life in Europe, or better, to flee the terrible situations in their own life. So these are not programs. Mostly it is illegal immigration. Illegal immigration. So we have to take into account of this. Third element is how can you integrate those people legal and illegal in our societies. Integration has to do with language. Immigration has to do with recognition of the basic values in the societies in which you are li or you, you will live in. The, what we call the rule of law, uh, equal chances, the rights of women, democracy, and so on. So I have to share the common values of those societies. Public values, not private values. Public values. It's not always easy. It's not always easy to, to have people from different backgrounds and cultures to accept the basic rules of the societies. There are huge success stories, but there are also problems. So integration in our societies uh, is uh, not an easy thing. And uh, some countries are are more successful than others. Again, we are a country with established population, not with traditions of migration. It's something completely different in the, in the mindset of people. So the acceptance of migration, or of particular groups of migrants, is much more difficult in the European societies than in other young nations founded on the basis of, of migration. But it, uh, it is not only inevitable, huh? uh, and you have to embrace what is inevitable. So I, I have to make the best of it. My last observation is that in a society facing economic problems, facing unemployment, in a society of rising individualism, and there's a phenomenon of a cultural phenomenon, not necessarily related to the economy. You can always present the other as a, an enemy. Somebody also who can take your job. Somebody who you can have to fear because he has, belongs to another culture, another religion, speaking another language and so on. So there is a lot of enemy thinking in societies in faced with crisis, economic crisis, but also faced with this, yeah, what I, I find no better word, as rising individualism. Not only, comes, there's not only something that happens in Europe, there's also the case in the United States, in Australia, in other countries. But there, if there is fear, the Germans would call it angst in society then migration can become even a political problem. Uh, and some of the parties now in, 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 in Europe, uh, their main theme is anti-migration. Even if we know that in the longer term we need migration, we need migration. And even if we know that there are success stories in integration. But you can easily exploit the feelings of anxiety and fear uh, and, and put the blame of all what's going wrong in a society on the others. 
And that is what's called populism. You are right and the others are wrong. And the others are the fault of all what's going wrong in our societies. And that we have to combat. If, if you go along with that kind of rhetoric, you only reinforce those tendencies. Of course, you have to listen to people and, and their worries and so on. But the basic trend of populism, you have to confront it. And I come from a country where this was very, very present at a certain moment of time. 25% of, uh, of the voters voted for an extremist racist party. Now, 6 or 7%. 6 or 7%. So, but we confronted him and with all the traditional parties. Uh, we were in some way even courageous. Yeah. Imagine. Yeah. Um, but that is, a, that is a, one of the big issues. The big issues in a lot of our member states today. It's a, a European problem to some extent. But it is a problem in each of the European countries. I'm not speaking about what's happening in other countries and so on, but you are facing almost the same kind of problems. But we all are living in democracies. And there the problem is others than in, in countries with other political regimes. I had the second question there in the middle somewhere. Yeah? Um, no, no, we need a microphone. Uh, Uh, my name is Alexander, I come from Austria, and within the last EU e elections we have seen that nationalist parties that are uh, EU skeptics have become stronger and stronger, especially in countries like France, also in my home country and in Great Britain, maybe you can touch upon that point, have become, become stronger and stronger. What can the EU do uh, to avoid this movement um, that is not really beneficial for the European Union as an institution itself? You come from Austria. Yeah. Yes. We had, you had populist parties in Austria long before the crisis of the Eurozone, long before the financial crisis. They were even in government at, at some moment of time. Um, so the, let's say, uh, and I'm, I'm elaborating on, on what I just said. We have in societies tendencies populist tendencies, blaming uh, others, independent of the financial and eurozone crisis, independent of the economic crisis. It was based to some extent, no, to a large extent, on the fear for migration, so surely in Austria. We have a very striking example in the Netherlands. There was a political party who was anti-Islam. And all of a sudden, they had problems with their electorate and they were not doing well in the opinion polls, and they changed from anti-Islam to anti-Europe overnight, overnight. Very striking that the other political parties, to some extent, also changed their political agenda, more traditional parties. So what does that mean? That means that Let's say there is an association between Europe and not migration, but the others, the others. Huh? You, you need something to blame. You need some, somebody to blame. And the crisis of the European idea is part of this more general crisis, more general crisis. So it is not only focused on Europe. I can say this all the more that according to all the surveys we have, for instance, national governments and national parliaments are inspiring even less confidence than European institutions. So it's a much broader movement than only Europe and the European idea. That's my second observation. My third is, of course, there are now 20-25% of Euro-negative votes or Euro anti-European votes. There are 75% others. 75% others. Huh? And so the institutions are now functioning, also the European government, of course, 
there is this block of 20-25 percent who are voting against everything. Huh? Uh, but the others are engaged in, uh, in giving support to a new commission and so on and so on. And then that will be the case for the, the upcoming five years. So let's also take the, uh, keep the sense of proportion. Huh? Uh, there is still an overwhelming uh, majority in the European Parliament in favor of the European project. Last observation, and I apologize because I give long answers to short questions. Eh? <laughs> Last observation. What is euro negative? I'm putting aside a little bit the case of the UK, very specific one. But I'm, <laughs> I'm speaking now of, on the others. The, I would say, I would not say it's 90%, uh, the, the percentage has no importance. But if you ask people if they want to go back to the situation before 1958, the good old days, uh, why when you cross the border between France and Belgium, uh, you have to queue on the, the, on the customs officer to declare how many cigarettes, how many, uh, tobacco and alcohol and so on, you have to show your identity card and And I'm now speaking of the, the citizen as a consumer. Of course, when you tell this to all people, they, they just don't believe you that this can happen again. They, they, can, they don't really, they are criticizing the European institutions, huh? but they want Europe, of course. It, 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 practically, it, almost the same with, uh, with, with the euro. In, in, in Greece, they had elections two years ago. On, and in those elections, then the major, overwhelming majority, even if they are voting, or they, they voted at that time for a so-called anti-European party, were in favor of Greece staying in the Eurozone, 60, 70 percent. And it's even today the case. So people are, have, are criticizing institutions because there is a crisis and they expect that we solve the crisis. But the, these anti-European feelings are not going so far that they reject the European Union and they are applauding when they say Belgium is leaving the European Union, great. Huh? I no, 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 never no, no. met, I never met a guy of that kind. Never met. Huh? And I, I can say I'm in close contact with the population, at the least, least you can say, according to my wife, too close. Huh? <laughs> uh, but uh, this you have to, ma to, to make the difference between, let's say, some kind of political behavior uh, and the deep feelings that still exist in, 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 in the population and they are less anti-Europe than most people imagine. I have time for one short question and a short answer. Oh. <laughs> That's difficult. Yeah. Um, hello, uh, my name is Michael. I'm from Mensa. Okay, uh, my question is, recently Japan expanded the size of its QQE. Could you share your view on the viability and the challenges of that? And how about the, the possibility of European quantitative easing? Thank you. you what, was your, what was your first question on Japan and the Japan. Uh, Japan's QQE. What's your the, uh, the view on quantitative on easing by Japan? Yeah. Quantitative easing by Japan? My God. <laughs> Everybody has to solve his own problems. Huh? Uh, <laughs> so I will not give an opinion on what, uh, what's uh, happening in Japan, but I can just give you a description of the facts. Huh? The Japan was facing deflation for quite a time. Uh, and deflation is in this sense is a, a dangerous thing because in, a, in let's say when consumers are expecting lower prices, they tend to postpone uh, their, their expenditures. And so this uh, is hampering growth and this, uh, this put uh, constraints on private consumption. So the government, by monetary instruments, tried to, to reverse this tendency. And to some extent, they are successful because the, 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 the paradoxical thing that infl inflation is rising again. Um, so this monetary instrument and quantitative easing 
uh, it has to, you have to see this in the, in the context of this long time uh, uh, deflationary tendencies, but it's not uh, my task to give of to comment or to to say what the others have to do. Huh? And I'm all the more cautious because during the crisis of the Eurozone, the rest of the world has its opinion how that we had to tackle the Eurozone. Okay, I'm always open for good advice. Huh? Uh, but uh, so I became cautious when we, when we speak now on, on, on other countries. In Europe, uh, we have uh, what we call, you are an economist, uh, when we, ha we have what we call an accommodative monetary policy. More focused on interest rates, less on extend, extending the balance sheet of the, of the central bank. But we have very low interest rates to help economic growth. In the Netherlands, for instance, they have the lowest interest rates since 400 years, since the foundation of the famous company, the Verenigde Oost-Indische Compagnie, the Dutch here in this room, uh, oh, most, most Singaporeans know it too. Because they, they were very active, by the way, in this region. Uh, yeah. not, not always yeah. appreciated later that's on. That's different. Uh, but that's something else. But we have the lowest interest rates since 100 years in, in some of our, our member states. Uh, we are now extending also the balance sheet of the, of the, of the bank. And that is in order to avoid deflation. We are not in a deflationary state. Uh, but in order to avoid to take no risks, uh, we are putting more money, more liquidity in the economy. Cautiously, because uh, we have a tradition of being having cautious monetary policy, but uh, we are doing so. The paradox is, there's another paradox, that the, our central bank had as an objective an inflation rate I speak now of the, since the foundation of the ECB, of 2%. You may not have an inflation rate beyond the 2%. What's happening now, the task of the central bank is to work so that we can have an inflation rate of 2%. That's the uh, short description of the, the new situation we, uh, we have uh, to face. So we are responsible for our own problems and I will not interfere in the problems of others. I will finish with the last quick question, but uh, uh, President uh, Van Rompuy, we, we living here in Singapore and uh, the image of Europe, frankly speaking, is not always a good one. Um, it's sort of seen as the European Union always too little too late. Um, a country that is sort of going, not a country, a continent that is sort of uh, very mature and going down and all the dynamics and the energy is this part of the world. Um, you, we seem to, uh, I mean, there are lots of questions about immigration uh, in the room here. Uh, we don't seem to be able to manage that very well. Um, I disagree, of course, with these statements. Of but course. Of course. Uh, <laughs> those are sort of the things that I pick up when I talk about Europe here. What would you answer to that? That they have, have to stop reading Anglo-Saxon media. <laughs> this is a populist answer. <laughs> no, um, seriously. Of course, we are fully aware of, uh, let's say, the negative uh, image uh, of, uh, of the European Union. There's already a journalist protesting. <laughs> <laughs> we are fully aware, surely, since the crisis in the Eurozone. Uh, it lasted very long, when deep-rooted pro problems, and you can't solve those deep-rooted problems overnight. But it took too much time to overcome them. We, we overcame them and that's for us it's enough. Uh, but I can imagine that uh, if you have all those, uh, you got all those messages uh, during two years that the overall image is so what's happening there and, and so on. So we, I, we are fully aware of it. So we can only 
enhance the image of Europe inside Europe, but that is our main responsibility, and outside Europe by proving that we can get results in terms of growth and in terms of jobs again. Um, and that, that's, uh, that's the first thing we have to do. People don't believe rhetoric, people believe facts and deeds and results and outcomes. So that is our main responsibility, not only vis-à-vis -vis the rest of the world, but vis-à-vis -vis our own people, our own electorate, our own people who are unemployed. So that is the main task. The second is, of course, that we have to learn to defend our own cause more. Uh, and uh, when I listen sometimes to European leaders giving press conferences in their own cities after a European Council, I have sometimes the impression that I attended another meeting. Eh? <laughs> uh, so we, we, have, we need to have the courage to defend what we did and to defend also the framework in which we are working. Eh? And to defend simply the European Union, not in a, in a stupid way, not, uh, not uh, in the way of, of not listening to people and to their concerns, but also giving answers. If you let the criticism go, uh, then uh, yeah, people tend to believe in it. And surely when responsible people, not only in politics but outside politics, are going along uh, those critics, then, then of course then it's very, very difficult to, to counter them and then you create a, let's say a general feeling around the European idea and uh, that, that become very negative. Of course, you, you also can ask the question, who has in the world today a positive image? <laughs> There's another question. Uh, there was a time that the United States of America had a very negative image, image all over the place. Huh? Uh, so it is less evident today. Uh, but things change, you know, it's not forever, but we have to prove, we have to prove that we uh, can manage not only the crisis, but that uh, we can be as uh, a competitive economy, but in general, uh, it is not known that we are the biggest provider, for instance, for development aid in the world. Half of the development aid is coming from the European Union and its member states. When there is a humanitarian catastrophe in the world, we are not the best marketeers, but if you see who is providing funds, not most of the time, in all the cases, it is the European Union. Even on Ebola, even on, the, uh, on Ebola, even if there is all over the place a catastrophe, we are the first there. We are, in some way, the biggest soft power in the world. When it is about climate change, we are not always recognized for it. And of course, there is the, the history of pollution, and I am fully aware of it. But we changed. We changed. People may change in the course of their history. May change. And we are now leading by example on climate change with those legally binding agreements and complying with our own targets. So there is also another story, another story uh, to tell, but I will come back one day Great. to tell you the, <laughs> um, the full story. I feel that this hour was far too short because we could have talked about many other things like Ukraine, Ebola, and other things that are very important. But I sort of noted down for myself four points. That is, first of all, and not in order of importance, but more in order of that what is discussed is G20 is important because that's the place where people actually talk to each other and perhaps it's the first time in, in human history that leaders of competing countries actually have a forum where they can uh, talk over things. Secondly, uh, Europe and uh, European, the Euro is not, is not only an economic project, it is an economic project but it's a civilization project. And perhaps we not always fully understand what drives people that defend uh, the European Union or that drives uh, the, Euro the Euro as a, uh, as a uh, currency, that uh, actually it's more a political and a civilization project than a purely, purely economic project. Third point, I think we learned a lot about how to get consensus uh, among 28 people. 
uh, I sort of wrote down for me the 28 headed head of state uh, that uh, uh, is, is quite an, uh, a challenge to manage, uh, but that it is about having a positive culture of uh, uh, consensus and ensuring that we want to make a consensus. And then finally, I think about immigration and populist parties. I think the message was you can do something about it. If you address uh, the issues, if you address it, confront uh, that populism, uh, you can actually overcome it as a democratic country. And I think those are very important messages. There was a lot more than that, but I wanted to summarize it. And I think uh, you will be uh, joining me in thanking uh, His Excellency uh, President Van Rompuy for the openness with which he addressed the questions. Um, and I hope that you will join me in a warm round of applause.